Morena, good morning everybody. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. Um, I'd like to pay a very warm welcome to our guest of honour, Glenn Sowry, of course, CEO of MetLife Care. Glenn, kia ora and welcome to you today. I'd like to also thank welcome you, our, moder oh, sorry. <laughs> our moderator for today, Janine Stewart, partner at Montreal's and Rad Rad Watts. Kia ora Janine and welcome to you today you. as well. Before we get started and I hand over to Janine, I just wanted to quickly run through the housekeeping with you all. Um, so as you will have seen, we are recording today's session. It is on the record and we welcome the media that are joining in with us. Um, we do encourage you all to have your web webcam on and we'd love to hear your questions throughout the conversation today. You can either ask these through the chat or you can um, message Janine or wave your hand up to her and she'll ask you to unmute yourself and come on and ask your question. So, Janine, I'll hand over to you now to get us started. Thank you very much, Sharon, and good morning, everybody. Um, as Sharon said, I'm a partner at Mintrails and Rod Watts, and during the course of lockdown and COVID-19, I was very focused on the construction and property industries, um, but it's been really interesting for me in preparing for this session and speaking with Glenn to sort of stick um, my head above the parapet and understand more about um, the impact of lockdown and COVID-19 on um, listed entities and at a governance industry and organisational level. And those are the broad topics of focus that we want to work through with Glenn today. Um, how we'll do it is I'll um, start off with um, a few questions with Glenn to get things underway and then we'll move to audience questions and really try and cover all angles. But I think Whilst we are looking at the impact of lockdown and of COVID-19, what we also really want to look at is what will MetLife Care take forward as a result of their experience of lockdown and COVID-19. So um, having worked through my brief introduction and without further ado, I'd like to start with some industry focused questions for Glenn. Um, now Glenn, the aged care and retirement industries are particularly vulnerable in COVID-19 and MetLife Care services arguably the most vulnerable of our population in these times. Now, how do you feel the industry uh, faced COVID during lockdown? And do you think it did it well? Well, good morning, Janine and everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, so that question, I think, when we uh, were faced with an emerging COVID threat in New Zealand, and MetLife Care is a New Zealand-centric business, we don't have operations in Australia at this stage, but uh, it became very apparent when we looked at what was going on internationally that the risk to our resident base was enormous. One only needed to uh, look and see what was happening in the US, in the UK, in Europe, so first world countries, where we were seeing um, really tragic loss of life of older people in retirement villages and aged care facilities. And the reality, as everyone now knows, is that COVID-19 as a virus is particularly um, fatal to people with comorbidities or underlying health conditions and generally it doesn't affect as badly people with good uh, levels of health. Whereas older people, when you looked at the statistics, um, made up the bulk of the, of the deaths that were occurring internationally. So that became very clear to us that that presented enormous risk um, were it to get away in a village or a care home. So as a consequence, the sector um, so if I break it into two and then merge them back together. So the retirement village sector, which is the operators that uh, operate independent living villages, um, where people are free to come, come and go and, and live pretty vibrant lives typically, was an area um, that we needed to be very focused on. But more specifically was the aged care part of our businesses, which is to all intents and purposes private hospitals with older people with underlying health conditions which saw them being uh, residents of a residential aged care facility. They were by miles the most at risk. So the CEOs of all of those operators came together. We recognised the risk to our residents 
and indeed to our businesses if we lost control of COVID in one or more of our facilities, both reputationally and uh, one could also argue you know, our social licence to operate and the duty of care that we have to our residents. So we were very, very focused on doing everything we could to keep it out in exactly the same way that the government's response was, was to try and eliminate and keep COVID out of, out of communities as much as possible. So we had a, a, a weekly um, one of these calls with all of the CEOs of the major operators. We had the retirement commissioner, Jane Wrightson, attended every meeting. So it was very open. It was all about sharing best practice uh, what we were seeing happening both at a clinical and, and a public health level, but also what the various initiatives were that each of us were doing to keep our residents safe and well. And so we were sharing what we saw as best practices that emerged. And I think it was very effective. We also had our head clinical leads for each of our businesses. So at MetLife Care, our clinical director, was a participant in a group called the Nurse Leadership Group, which was a subset of the Aged Care Association, and they were very focused on the clinical response, um, particularly in the care homes. So I think when you look at it, the, of the major operators, um, there was virtually no COVID um, uh, made its way in. At MetLife Care, very tragically, we had a resident pass away from COVID um, at one of our independent uh, villages in Kapiti. And it was a couple who had four days earlier returned from a month in Australia on holiday, including a two week cruise, where it appears very sadly, they contracted COVID, a husband and wife, and they were both admitted to hospital very soon after they returned to the village. Um, and tragically, uh, the gentleman passed away of COVID a few weeks later. That, um, that the fact that we had no transmission within the village, as you might imagine, was an enormous relief to myself and the company. Um, but I think it was also a reflection of the systems and processes that we had in place to minimise and keep our residents safe during that period. Just um, talking about the nurse leadership group, I was speaking with another um, retirement village operator last night and they also mentioned the nurse leadership group and the value that they gained out of that forum. Um, even more so, she, and she said, in these circumstances than at the executive level. So it's, it's interesting that you do speak to that um, and the essentially the, the practices that they put in place for risk management as a result of those sessions. Um, but before we move on and sort of drilling down a bit more to MetLife Care itself. Um, I think everybody will be well aware that not only were you dealing with uh, COVID-19 in recent times, but a major transaction. Uh, what are you able to tell us about that? Yes, yeah, so it was um, just to make the, the period interesting. Um, not only did we have COVID at play, but we had a, um, a scheme of arrangement for a takeover of the company that was um, uh, came under threat during the COVID process and ultimately the, the bidder uh, terminated uh, the agreement through that period. So that made uh, times pretty interesting managing both the corporate activity that we had going on with that, plus also, of course, our focus, primary focus on keeping people safe through the COVID lockdown and, and pandemic risk. Um, what we've, uh, some of you may be aware that last week, last Friday, in fact, we announced a new uh, scheme implementation agreement with um, Asia Pacific Village Group, which is a subsidiary of EQT, a large Swedish uh, private equity company who were the original bidder. Um, and they've entered into a new agreement at $6 per share for the company, values that are just shy of $1.3 billion. And so we're going through that process now. We've announced that to the NZX and ASX last Friday. And there's a sequence of events that need to occur now, um, which are fairly set piece, um, including OIO approval, so Overseas Investment Office approval, 
um, and that will take around three months. So all going well, we will have a shareholder meeting in October where shareholders get to vote on the, on the deal, the transaction, and assuming that is agreed, um, New Zealand Super as our cornerstone shareholder at 20% has, has entered into a voting deed with EQT to uh, commit to the transaction. And uh, all going well, the company will, will change ownership towards the end of October. There's not really a great deal more I can say on it at the moment as a, as a feature of the scheme implementation agreement. We've agreed that we will not Neither party will be making further comment on details or aspects of the agreement until the scheme booklet and the, and the scheme um, special shareholder meeting in October. So there's been plenty going on. <laughs> well, no doubt you'll be able to talk to us about how um, the governance operations functioned through the digital world during COVID. But before we turn to that, um, we talked yesterday about the difference, the difference risk, the different risks, if any, that the New Zealand industry may have faced compared to Australia. Now, in my sector, um, we had quite a lot to do with the Australian lawyers who were working in the construction space in terms of the claims that were being made and the challenges on site and keeping construction going. But it, they, were, they were very different because in Australia, they didn't have a complete lockdown um, in some of the states. Certain things kept going. So there were certainly differences in so far as my industry was concerned. But how do you see the risks differed insofar as your industry is concerned? I think um, the really interesting thing was when uh, the government announced the, the levels and the way uh, it would respond uh, to differing COVID threats and the concept of a lockdown, at one level, from a, from a keeping um, our communities and our residents safe perspective, the lockdown was a good thing because it actually made life pretty binary. All of us, every one of us on this call in New Zealand, all of our residents, all of our construction partners, we all basically shut down. Now, whilst that presented a significant commercial challenge for the business in terms of not being able to sell during that period, um, not being able to continue with construction activity and the like, even in a safer environment, we at least knew what we were dealing with and we could deal with it. From a health and safety of our residents' perspective, um, I think the fact that there was not widespread COVID transmission in care homes, there were some small pockets, as, we're, as many of you will be aware, with uh, small in New Zealand care homes. Uh, where tragically there was, you know, recently substantial loss of life. In fact, virtually all of the deaths in New Zealand uh, were with older people and many of those in care facilities. So the risk, you know, that amplified and, and brought home the real risk that was presented. But it did make it, in some respects, Janine, a bit cleaner. And, um, and so with our constructors, they demobilised. We had uh, conversations about what compensation was going to be due for the time uh, incurred, and we've been able to navigate our way through that, uh, to be honest, pretty cleanly, touch wood, so far. I'm going to come to what you learned and that what, what you're going to take forward for the next 12 months a bit later, but just turning more to sort of how you operated as an organisation and looking first at governance level, how, do, how did MetLife Care at a governance level deal with the lockdown and maybe talk to us about how the digital world was utilised through that process and especially given that you weren't only dealing with COVID but you were dealing with other major corporate issues. So in terms of the interaction with the board, um, like, like everyone on this call, I'm sure we all had a crash course in digital communication. And, uh, and fortunately, we had a good um, digital lead um, who was able to get the organisation set up very swiftly. We had Microsoft Teams enabled, uh, just like everyone else, we'd never gotten around to using it in, in any meaningful way. So we all uh, had a, a very compressed uh, learning curve on how to use the technology efficiently. And I'm sure like everyone on this call, we discovered it was actually remarkably effective. 
So we were able to have regular board calls. So I was talking to the board at least um, twice to three times, typically three times a week. I'd provide a daily update at 5 p.m. each day on any COVID related issues that were going on um, and the risks, how we were managing them. Um, and so they, uh, as good governors should, um, got out of management's way and didn't jump in the middle and try and uh, manage the company on our behalf. So I was really appreciative of the way the board managed uh, that dynamic. And, you know, most of our board have been senior managers in their previous careers and understood their role was there to support, uh, guide and challenge management to make sure that we had things covered. And they did a very good job of that without uh, trying to do our job for us. Or, or creating more work. Uh, as an exec team, uh, we had a morning stand-up meeting at 9am every morning on Teams. Um, and depending, in the earlier days of the lockdown and the threat, um, those could take up to an hour. Towards the end of it, they were taking uh, typically 20 minutes and they're very action oriented. What do we need to know? What are the decisions we need to make today? What are the emerging risks? How are our people doing? Um, how's the welfare of our residents? Have, are we covering the things we need to be doing? Um, so they were very tactical in nature, but they work very effectively. When we spoke yesterday, you talked about some of your operational team, as opposed to executive, really shining through and demonstrating some real skills in terms of how they managed the crisis. Do you want to talk to us about that? Yes, yeah, so one of the, um, like any organisation, you know, we're medium sized, we're not a big corporate. We've got a bit over 100 people in our corporate office um, and um, around 1,000 or so spread across our villages and care homes. Uh, if you like, on the front line. What we found was that because we couldn't make decisions and consult and collaborate and all that sort of stuff in the way that we typically would have when we're all in an office together, um, we actually did things a whole lot quicker. And so we involved fewer people in decision making we gave people deeper in the organisation more accountability and authority to make decisions. And some of the things we implemented, like, I'll give an example, you know, what, uh, it became very clear that one of the things we needed to do if we wanted residents to stay at home was how do we do their grocery shopping for them? Seemed a pretty simple thing, um, simple challenge uh, to solve. Uh, but it required quite a bit of effort to, to get sorted. And so we just, and we threw the challenge to three people in the business and said, go for it. And don't come to us asking for permission. You've got full authority to do what you need to get the job done. And they came up with the solution in less than 24 hours and it was implemented 24 hours after that. You know, frankly, we would never have done that in peacetime. You know, we would have been talking about it, making sure everyone had a say in it, and, and we would have got stuck in quicksand. And so what we saw was that we had some people that were really capable beneath the executive level when you gave them the mandate and permission to do it, that were very effective at getting things done. And so the huge learning as an organisation we've taken out of it is that um, at a time of crisis, um, when we were prepared to disrupt the normal decision-making process, we moved much quicker. And I, th I think in some respects made much more effective decisions. And so what we've done a lot of work post um, COVID on is how do we codify that and embed that way of working. And so we've got a big stream of work that we've established, we're calling it a business transformation project, which is how do we um, bring all of that learning and just fundamentally change the way we make decisions and run the business. And a lot of the people that stood up 
through COVID and really demonstrated really strong leadership uh, actively involved with that business transformation project and have been doing an awesome job. So you've obviously taken that forward in terms of what you're going to be doing for the next 12 months. Um, another issue that came up last night when I was talking to, as I said, another operator was the, um, were the issues um, on a daily basis where there was sort of a sense of panic um, from residents' families and she mentioned, you know, they'd be getting calls like, X has now got security guards, what are you going to do about this? Did you have a, a way of dealing with those sorts of issues as well? Yeah, and I think, um, you know, I know there's a lot of uh, communications leaders and professionals on this call, and so a lot of this will be sort of motherhood and apple pie a little bit um, for, for the folk on this call. But, you know, communications and, and really good ways, uh, dynamic ways of being able to engage with residents and their families uh, to state the obvious, we recognise was going to be extremely important. And so as a consequence of that, we set up um, using a new system we had fortuitously mobilised in the business for marketing, actually, a system called Marketo, which is essentially a, a digital communications channel. Um, we were able to communicate with residents and their families where we had their email addresses. And the really encouraging thing was we had huge numbers of families saying, we want to be communicated with, please please take our email address and we want to hear from you. So that database, if you like, of that network that we could communicate with grew exponentially in the early days of COVID. And so one of the things I thought was we needed to make it very personal. And so um, I would do a couple of times a week a video which literally was my partner holding my phone and me talking to, to the camera about what was going on in our business, acknowledging their anxiety um, and what we were doing to keep um, their family safe and how they could participate and support their family and village and what we're doing to enable that. So we got really good feedback on that. The open rate on those emails was, if, if that was a marketing campaign, you would have died to have that level of opening rate and, 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 and you know, how much cut through and readability that had. So during those times, you know, we had um, extraordinary levels of engagement. We had the ability for people to be able to email us or call in. Um, and one of the things we did was we implemented um, we, we kind of had this principle of no one gets left behind. And what I mean by that is we said, we felt it was very important that every resident that was in their unit did not become isolated and metaphorically left behind um, through this period. So we had, we mobilized a team that called every single resident twice during the lockdown, given that we couldn't interact uh, in the community facility or residents couldn't, you know, neighbours couldn't go and knock on each other's doors the way they normally would to check how they're doing um, without, you know, breaching social isolation or social, social distancing, I should say. So we thought quite deeply about how we could um, make sure that we created and maintained that connection. And um, I think we did a pretty good job of it. We, we got very good feedback. Um, and again, that's something that we're looking at how we can keep that going um, post COVID or post the lockdown. Just listening to you, and I've, I've, I haven't got to sort of your, the personal leadership um, challenges that you face, but if we look at MetLife Care at a governance um, executive and operational level, um, my take is that every level has had its challenges, but operationally, that's probably where the, the biggest challenge was. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. And we had um, in the village, because we made the decision to have uh, security at the gates of our villages or the entrances so that we couldn't have people from outside the villages, um, you know, just flooding in and, and risking breaching uh, social distancing protocols and legal requirements. 
um, we, we needed to make sure that we didn't isolate people more than we needed to. So we had folk at the gates where families could come, bring, you know, care packages or goodie packages or technology or whatever it might be to residents um, and we would distribute it um, around the village. We had people from support office that weren't required to do their normal BAU roles uh, redeployed out to the villages who would do things like grocery delivery or meal deliveries, you know, organising, uh, you know, virtual activities or, you know, ways of people exercising on their balconies or all sorts of weird and wonderful things that we had going on. Um, to try and maintain social cohesion and support for residents whilst they are isolated. Because, you know, with our, our villages are a cross-section of humanity, you know, roughly half the people on this call are introverts and roughly half are extroverts, and we all kind of deal with these things differently. And so us really understanding that, you know, extroverts were going to suffer, because they couldn't have that social interaction that was very important to them and how could we supplement that? And introverts, you know, that, that could potentially become really introvert and, and become, you know, potentially, you know, emotionally unwell uh, from being completely isolated um, was something we were very mindful of as well. I've just got a question here. Um, no, I don't actually. Sorry, my apologies. But while we are on the on the themes that I've been trying to work through, which is government, executive, and operational, I'd like to put it to the floor and see if any of you have any questions for Glenn. Jeffrey, I have seen you raise your arms a few times. Does that mean you have a question? No. Okay. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions they'd like to put forward? We encourage you to do so. Hi, Janine. It's Zeddy Vankovic here from Toll Group. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Good morning. Good morning. And um, thank you very much, Glenn, for that really interesting overview. I think for me, it's particularly topical. Um, I'm in Melbourne and um, I have a mother who's in an aged or in a home care facility. Um, so I've really enjoyed listening to your perspective on how you've managed I guess, looking after your residents, but also communicating with, with, with the families um, who are an equally important stakeholder for you. And I think um, just a couple of questions I've got, I guess, mainly from a comms um, perspective, uh, you know, you talked about um, being in regular contact with the families during this, this time, which is obviously very important because, um, again, speaking from my own experience, it was really important to me to have that reassurance that mum was being well looked after. Um, because we can't go there and visit. So I'm just wondering, and you mentioned your, um, your uh, emails were very well received, high open rates. Um, and I guess the questions I have are, um, how is this going to change potentially the way you engage with the families on a longer term basis? Is that something that you're, you've thought about? Um, and uh, did you use social media as well as part of your interaction with families? I know that um, the, the centre where mum was staying at, they started using Facebook, for example, to create that community, taking pictures of residents, and I thought that was a really novel way of broadening their engagement with stakeholders. And um, I guess another, another question, and apologies if I'm throwing a lot at you at the same time, um, it's how did you get feedback from families on what was important to them? What were the sort of things that they wanted to hear from you um, to give them that reassurance? Or is that something that you're looking to do? What's, I guess, the feedback and the two-way uh, mechanism that you're engaging with the families? Thank you. Um, thank you, Seth, for the questions. And I hope your, your mum's doing okay. Challenging times, obviously, with, with Melbourne um, being in lockdown again. And, you know, the experience you've described is exactly what we were dealing with and, and trying to provide support for. In terms of um, will we embed this in terms of the way we communicate with families going forward, uh, the short answer is yes. The, the, the tricky bit, of course, is making sure that we don't abuse or overuse that communications channel during a time of crisis like a lockdown where people physically couldn't uh, see each other, the need for that was was obvious. 
Um, I think what we've got to be very careful about is that when we do communicate, we've got something meaningful to say that's um, that's of value or interest to a family rather than noise. So that's the thing we're very careful about making sure we don't overreach or overstep in that respect. But I think unquestionably, you know, the whole digital uh, communications channel um, is incredibly important. We didn't, our social media strategy and footprint uh, is not as mature and, and strong as it needs to be. And this highlighted that, if I'm really honest. So we, this is an area we've been talking about for some time and it did highlight the fact that we've got um, work to do to have really meaningful engagement um, with, our, with our residents and families um, through social media. The really interesting thing is getting that balance right so that it is meaningful engagement and that it's adding value, not just noise or wallpaper. And, and that's something we continue to work on. The feedback loop was essentially, um, we set up a, an email address for people to click on and my emails to reply to. So you could provide any feedback at any time on anything. And I would often refer to that in my communications back if there was a significant issue that had been raised that very clearly was of, of general interest or wider interest to families or residents, then uh, we'd address it in the next piece of communication. Um, again, it's, that's, you know, all, you know, fairly, uh, you know, it's not as good as, or in, as interactive as I think it can or should be in the future. And that's an area that we are, as I say, doing quite a bit of thinking about how do we lift our game in that space. Did I answer everything or have I missed something? No, thank you, Glenn. I appreciate the response and the, and the honest assessment as well. I think we can always improve um, um, wherever we are. So thank you. Yep. Andrew Smith, I'll turn to you. I know you have raised a question in the group chat, but would you like to unmute and uh, put it to Glenn directly? Thanks, Janine, and, and thanks, Glenn, for your time today. Great insights. Um, I was just looking for the, the broader picture around your strategic and business model uh, elements and what you're considering changing as a result of the, the risk assessments on one hand and the COVID-19's learnings on the other as well. So I think if we... Um, really good question. Thank you, Andrew. If we look at... Um, the way we're going to change the way the business operates as a consequence of COVID-19, we are very, very purposeful about how we're going to become a much more digitally enabled company. You know, everyone's talked about it, we've talked about it, um, but we are, become, we are very, very purposeful in terms of the way we're looking at that, so the way we sell, the way we market, the way we communicate and engage with our existing residents, um, potential residents, how do we create communities of interest um, uh, that we could potentially support outside of the village. Um, that's something we've been uh, kicking the tires on for some time and we're doing some meaningful work in that space at the moment. When it comes to uh, the, the physical infrastructure, if you like, um, things like how do we, the care homes, uh, we think coped pretty well, but we're thinking about do we need to make tweaks to the design of those going forward to ensure that we can operate those safer in an outbreak situation. You know, the reality is that an aged care home from time to time is susceptible to outbreak. You know, it could be norovirus. You know, that happens from time to time where you get a bug in an aged care facility and you need to isolate and lock the facility down to um, restrict or minimise the risk of spread. You know, COVID as a pandemic virus was an extreme form of that, very obviously. Um, so we think that the facilities lent themselves pretty well uh, to managing that. But again, you know, when we look at the common facilities in the villages themselves, 
you know, how could they, you know, potentially uh, operate in a different way in the future where you can have smaller communities of people continue to socially interact in a safer way. Just simple things like contactless payment so that you can go and get a coffee at a cafe. You know, we, um, we are accelerating rapidly the work we need to do to become uh, a much more, you know, digital commercial organisation in the villages where we've been fairly traditional in the past. So things like that, we, um, you know, I call those no regrets, um, you know, moves. And we've identified through this BT process with, you know, these really smart people in our business they identified a whole series of pain points or ways that we can just um, take friction out of the way we engage and do business and support our residents and indeed run the business. So there's a heap of it, but if I was to use one word, Andrew, it's digital. Thanks, Glenn. Just drawing on, on Andrew's question, and I, I suppose essentially in the capacity that I've always known, um, MetLife Care in terms of my relationship, it's very much been about development and construction. And I think it's fair to say that has been somewhat of a focus over the last few years. Would you say that's changing now? You're consolidating and really um, working on what's happening internally and like you say, um, putting new tools in place, or are you still seeing that as part of the future? Oh, it's very much an and, Janine. Yeah. You know, for for us as a business to grow, um, we uh, we need to continue to build and uh, build and develop new retirement villages and aged care facilities. So that remains a very core part of our strategy and what we're doing. And we've got some, you know, we think some extremely exciting projects you're familiar with that are, are coming out of the ground uh, imminently. Um, that we think are going to, in many respects, redefine what uh, a modern retirement village or retirement community is going to look like. So um, none of them have fences around them, that none of them are gated communities in the traditional sense. So they're much more um, embedded uh, and part of the communities that we're building in. So that's really important. But a lot of what we've been talking about, I kind of, in my, in my own head, I think of it as the hardware side of our business and the software side of our business. You know, the hardware is the built form and the physical infrastructure we build and create. And we create homes for people to live in. You know, that's a, a core part of what we do. And the software side, I think of as the services and the human element of the, of the in-village or in-care experience that a resident or a resident's family has with us. And the, in the interaction or the interface between what we build and the way we operate it and the way a person lives in it, you know, those must be completely seamless. I'm going to, I do have another question for you, but I, I could go on for quite some time. Does anybody else in the audience um, want to put any questions to Glenn? We've got a few minutes left before I hand back over uh, to Cerise. So um, now's your chance. We have Glenn on the floor. Yes, Baz. Thanks, and um, thanks for your chat, Glenn. Um, I'm really curious about the industry discussions that you said you were having, I think, on a weekly basis. Um, and I'm coming from an Australian lens and I'm Melbourneian based as well, well I'm Melbourne based. Um, but I'm curious because the aged care sector in Australia has had a bit of a, a rough time more recently in, in the last year or two. Has there been any discussions at an industry level around either how you make the most out of a crisis? It sounds like a lot of the operators have done a really good job about either repositioning the industry or I guess broader telling of your story in terms of the care and concern that you've, you've really demonstrated and obviously followed through on? I think Baz, coming into, uh, into this crisis, and let's call it what it was, it was a crisis. You know, to me, I talked to our board at length, you know, my background, some of you may be aware is, is um, actually in corporate communication. So I've, I, I, this is stuff I believe very strongly. And to me, I thought there was 
um, there were two potential outcomes from this whole experience. Our brand and our reputation could be enhanced by really going above and beyond and having our customers, our residents at the core of all decision making and everything we did. And, and the evidence of that would be that people were safe and didn't become unwell with COVID and were well supported more so than they would have been in their own home living out in the wider community. The alternative or the counterfactual is that um, we had, um, as a sector, it got away on us and we had widespread loss of life and we didn't do the right thing by our residents. Now, those are two pretty binary outcomes um, and that absolutely shaped all of our decision making. Um, and we spent a lot of money, um, a lot of money um, on, on PPE that we, we bought proactively on on putting labour into villages, extra people to support residents, the security, you know, literally millions of dollars that we spent during this period to do the right thing. And, and we did that um, without a, equivocation because it was the right thing to do. And the result would, would uh, take care of themselves. And fortunately to date, that's been the case. So I think, as a sector, we recognised that was the risk and the opportunity. And we saw that success as a sector would be that we came out the other side of lockdown and the immediate crisis with the reputation and the credibility of the sector enhanced. And I believe that's what's happened. And indeed, we've seen really good sales response um, from people who's, who have post lockdown said we actually want to live in this environment because we recognize it's a safe supportive um, environment for us to be living in uh, in the future and so i would say that's the ultimate measure of success which you know to date um you know COVID remains as as, as you our friends on the other side does know all too well it's alive and well and a clear and present danger to all of us and, um, and, and it's ever present. So, um, so it remains um, front, front and center of our minds. Thank you, Glenn. Um, it is time for me to now hand over, but if anybody wants to ask one more question, and so long as everybody's happy to stay online, if you want to hear the answer, please um, raise your hand now or unmute yourself and, and jump in. No, nope, I think I think I think that's good. Um, Glenn, before I hand over and just very succinctly, what are you most looking forward to for the next twelve months? Really good question. I think um, for us, as I mentioned earlier, we've got some really exciting development projects which are, which will be coming into physical build in the coming next few months. I'm really excited about seeing those coming to life. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of work and energy gone into getting them to this point with design consenting, all of all of the hard yards that goes, you know, a number of people on this call know goes on behind the scenes before you start seeing construction occur. So that's really exciting. But probably above all is the potential that I genuinely believe we're going to unlock from the Space Business Transformation Project that we've got underway. You know, we have the chance to really embrace the opportunity to do things differently. You know, it's that wonderful expression, never waste a good crisis. And uh, I'm pretty determined that we're not going to. Thank you. All right, uh, Cerise, I'll hand over to you now. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Thank you so much, Janine, for your excellent moderation. And Glenn, thank you for your time today. You would have seen the business sentiment poll pop up on your screen. Please take a few moments to fill this one in and we will then share the results. In the meantime, Glenn, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us today on resilient leadership. Your industry and story definitely fit very well within that topic. Your resilience and thought leadership are inspiring and we appreciate you sharing with us the challenges you have faced, but also still facing as a leader, the solutions implemented and your plans for the future. 
I also found very moving to hear your emotional challenges that you have been through. Thank you for doing your best in keeping our parents, grandparents and relatives safe. Your empathy and communication skills show great leadership. On a more personal note, we always love to know more about our speakers and um, your background in sailing is quite impressive. So we look forward to seeing you on the water again. You would see now the business sentiment poll results. So most of you feel innovative. 88% believe that the government is doing a good job in the crisis. Um, well, 12 months and over 12 months, 50-50 believe that um, it will be over. So quite a very long time now. 75% feel that your, the bubble will provide benefits to your business and 100% of you find, um, believe that the event today has met your objective. So all of you, thank you. Thank you also to our series partners, Quang Group Bank of Australia, IBM, Red Hat and ServiceNow. We would not be able to do what we do without you. Thank you to all of you for joining us today. Janine, thank you again for leading a great conversation and I will now hand over to Glenn for the final words. Thank you, Therese, and um, thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to uh, have a chat to you this morning. Um, you know, the, the Circle's clearly a great forum for you know, sharing observations, learnings, experiences, and um, based you know, on what we saw, the way we, um, through the crisis, you know, the wisdom of crowds and the ability to learn from each other's experiences um, to not be scared to ask dumb questions, um, ask for help, ask for advice. Um, none of us know the answers to all of the questions through these times. So I think forums like this are incredibly valuable and useful. Um, and so, you know, thank you for the opportunity to be part of that. I hope you got a little bit out of this and uh, encourage you to keep reaching out to your networks and and, uh, and working together for the greater good and to keep your businesses strong and healthy. Thank you.